Finally got over to New York City. You know what, it felt like ages because we were trying to plan a trip probably about 2019, but as we well know, uh, days. Things shut down. There, there was uh, the, the, the mad uh, pandemic coronavirus and it was delayed, delayed, delayed. And so we actually had Nemo Labrizi, who I know is a friend, of, you, know, yes. you know, a friend of yours. Um, he came over recently to do a project with us at the Hamyard Hotel to speak about street art as a whole and also his contribution towards the Shadow Man documentary and then speak about Hamilton and his affiliates, etc. And I always said that when I get over to New York, I have to come and see you because we done a show back in 2018 now, was it? 19. 19, okay. After, I remember that show because it got us into GQ, which was a really, really cool publication. And the two murals that you've done, one in Soho and also one in Shoreditch, Shoreditch. was really, really cool. So what have you been up to since then? Well, like yourself, I mean, the last year seems to be like a, like a blur. Uh, because of the pandemic and quarantine, so there hadn't been any travel or anything like that overseas or any other destinations. However, I've still been really busy in the studio and it enabled me to have this sort of quiet time and real introspective period where I could concentrate on various aspects of my work that I had been neglecting for, for a while. So, you know, yeah, it's, it's been continued, con uh, continued flurry of different things that I've been working on. Yeah, what's the, like the general kind of feeling of the uh, street art sort of movement, culture and, and the market right now, post pandemic? I say, when I say post, I kind of feel like we're still in it a little bit, but yeah. what, what's, the, what's the general kind of appetite for collectors at the moment? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, that's a barometer that I don't really measure too often, especially when I'm in the city. I mean, I think it's really strong because there's a lot of significant exhibitions that are being planned for the next few years. Uh, I have uh, a really um, amazing exhibition that I have coming up at PPLW Gallery here in New York. And um, it's work that I have been focusing on for the past several years, so I'm excited to share that with people. But, you know, in general, um, things are continuing on. You know, I don't think that we've completely recovered as a, as a society, but it's on the way. It definitely is. It's on the way, and I, I don't think it's gonna be the same thing. Yeah. But, you know. I know yeah. this sounds a bit cliche, you know, when they say things happen for a reason, and it's not about how you, when something happens to you, such as a pandemic, a recession, and, and these lockdowns, you know, you can either react or you can respond. And I know, for example, I'm very much into my fitness, so I like boxing and everything else. In actual fact, I'm competing boxing again in, in, oh. in March next year. Cool. So it's something to, to aim towards. And I know certain people in the lockdown, unfortunately, uh, their health deteriorated because they wasn't seeing people, mental health side of stuff, drinking, drugs, etc. But then there was another group of people actually lifted up their, yes. their health and well-being. They were training more, you know, they were doing more Zooms, they were taking more calls with their family. And it kind of got them to realise what is important when everything is stripped away. So the question I'm getting to here is, how has the kind of pandemic influenced your style, your work? Has it at all, or have you ventured into new things because you've got a bit more, I don't know, a little bit more inspiration with what's going on out there? Well, I think artists are a pretty unique bunch in, uh, as a whole because, you know, artists to begin with are kind of isolationists anyway. You know, we're in our studios, or we're in this kind of headset where we're concentrating on our work. So I'm not gonna say that it didn't affect me, but I will say that it affected me probably less than other people that are, are more used to kind of being social all the time, all the time, or working with people. You know, I'm in the studio, nobody else is here, I'm working. You know, I don't feel as isolated maybe as other people might. But in terms of subject matter, just seeing the way that it changed the landscape of New York City, you know, that definitely influenced my work and what I was doing. It's good. 
So I think this is the second time I've ever been to the Bronx. Yeah. Uh, I came Welcome. here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's very, very famous, this place. I mean, the rappers, 50 Cent, you know, all these big... He's not from the Bronx. Well, I know, but what I'm yeah. saying is they all rap about the Bronx, yeah, you know, because yeah. it's obviously, a, it's a melting pot of creativity. Yeah. You know, there's obviously, I know, some edgy stuff that happens, some very creative stuff that happens, and I think it's just an interesting place. Um, how have you seen the Bronx over the last, how long you've been in the studio for? This particular one, probably like seven or eight years, but as a whole, I've had a studio in the Bronx since the early 80s. And how has it changed from right now, 2021 to the 80s? Well, you know, when we first got the studio, a studio in the Bronx, um, you know, it was, a, it was definitely more deteriorated and economically much more run down than it is now. Um, but I, I never really focused on those things, having a studio, because I always looked at the Bronx as uh, this palette where all this creative stuff would be happen, happening all the time. You know, it was more do it yourself. You didn't have people sponsoring you. You didn't have, you know, ask permission to do things. But nevertheless, there was always a lot of creative people here. I think it's getting um, better and better because you definitely see pockets now of development in communities where that didn't exist, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah. And um, obviously uh, being organically, you know, a street artist and doing your murals and your paintings and, and what you do best on the streets, yeah. is it something you're still doing, you know, actively on the streets? Uh, you know, I, doing murals is a part of my, my, uh, my work. You know, so wherever I travel to, I always try to incorporate doing some kind of mural. You know, when you talk about street art, being on the streets or whatever, you know, that's kind of what I do to keep in turn in, in tune with the public, you know, and, mm. and, and what they're thinking. Yeah. Do you know, like, um, I ask this to business people or even athletes, obviously being a boxer myself, I've interviewed a lot of boxers and I always ask them what motivates you because it's a very, very tough craft and sport. And so is being an artist though, even though there's a lot of good side to it, there's also times where you might have the equivalent of writer's block or trying to find a bit of inspiration or just things are not happening maybe. What, what's all, what motivates you? What inspires you? I think that uh, it, creating things is just a part of my life. So um, I always, you know, the more work that I do, the more ideas come out of that. Actually, that's something that, you know, like Francis Bacon kind of once said, you know, he was asked the exact same question and, you know, it's like, you know, the more work that he did, the more ideas uh, for a continual series of paintings that he had. And I feel the same way, you know, I, I'm working, whether it's on a mural or a, a project in the studio, a sculpture, whatever. And while I'm doing that, I'm thinking about the next thing and the thing after that. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that you've got um, a lot of projects coming up. Obviously in Miami, Basel's coming up, which is a yeah. melting pot of so many different artists, galleries, you know, people that exhibit cool works. Um, and then you also mentioned you're doing something in Tulum or near Tulum in Mexico, Acomal, yeah. which, which sounds really, really interesting. What I love about the art market or the creative side of, of life is it becomes not just a business, but it's a lifestyle, you know? Mm -hmm. So hence I'm here in New York. I mean, we're looking to do, try and do something in Paris next year. We're doing the, even though this is not linked to art directly, we're doing the Gumball Rally next year, but we're gonna wrap the car in, you know, some cool art and, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of networking, etc. So being an artist now from the streets and doing your work to, to now you're doing collaborations with big brands, you're touring the world. I mean, how's, how's that feel when you're, when you're doing that? You know, it, it feels kind of, it feels amazing. I mean, I'm not going to lie, you know, it's, it's great to be able to travel, you know, the project in Acomal, Mexico, the Acomal Art Festival, it'll be great because, um, you know, it's a, uh, sanctuary for turtles it's kind of where they hatch this particular part of mexico beautiful so a lot of the uh artwork that's produced there will be inspired by the environment myself included and uh you know I've, it'll be my second time part participating in that festival okay uh, and and also kind of the festival's going on but then the people that live there, the natives that live there are incorporated within all that because it gives them an opportunity to sell the crafts and the goods that they, they produce. 
Okay, good stuff. And then yeah. what, what are you doing in Basel? Oh, it's not Art Basel. I'm doing okay. something in Miami. Uh, it's called the With Me Art and Music Festival in Virginia Key Beach, Miami. And uh, I, I've created a, a large sculpture and I'm painting a mural kind of a, around it. So it'll be an environment. Okay. Uh, and it'll be like a three day, four day festival um, that is going to happen. And uh, what is it from? I want to get this right, November 25th or 26th to the 28th. Yeah. So, Fifth. yeah, it'll be good. Good stuff. To give the audience a bit of background, so obviously we worked on a project a few years ago. Um, we also done a podcast, which I mentioned to you that we're going to repurpose. So the, you're going to find that podcast chopped up and across loads of different platforms. And I think, uh, I, th I think it's going to be well received. This is obviously going to be out uh, very, very soon. Part of the reason why we got kind of connected is, as you well know, our background is with the Richard Hamilton market. Yeah. And then we obviously started looking at the, the affiliates and then obviously your name kept on coming up. One, because of your style. Two, because of your, you know, your, your connections to the streets and obviously you're a genuine, genuine organic street artist that everybody kind of always talks very, very good things about. But then also, like, something that people don't, don't know that you shared on my podcast before, you was actually Richard Hamilton's tenant, which is... Yeah, was... I mean, Richard and I um, were, were good friends, but he was also kind of my landlord for about five years <laughs> downtown. And um, I lived above his studio and his apartment downtown on Lower East Side. And I got to see a lot of um, his works in process and, of course, talked to him all, all the time. Um, so I, I was able to be fortunate enough to see how his work evolved, how, you know, both the work on the street that he was doing and, and in the studio. Yeah. You know, and I got to see how he prepared for exhibitions and, and all that. Unfortunately, I also kind of began to see his deterioration, which was, uh, which was really kind of tragic. And I, I saw the early stages of that happening. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah. When was you read a tenant back in the 80s? Yeah, in the early 80s, from 83 to, I want to say, maybe 87, okay. 1987. Okay, interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah or maybe, yeah, about 87. So, if you wouldn't mind, we're obviously in your, your studio. Uh, I can see some amazing works here. I know you actually uh, share the same premises as Crash, who's yes. been another, another one of my former guests on my podcast, who's a great guy, great artist. Yeah. Um, if, if you wouldn't mind, just walking me around and just show me some of, some of the pieces because I'm, I'm, I'm really interested. I would say when I'm looking at this, yeah. uh, you know, I'm not saying I'm the most trained eye out there, but this for me is your typical, typical style. This is, when I look at it, I think this has got days all over it. Um, would you support that or how, how would you? How would yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, this is a painting I did. Um, it's uh, called Eastern Parkway. It's uh, in Brooklyn and it's right in the neighborhood where I grew up. Um, it's right across from the Brooklyn Museum, and the, actually even last night I was looking at a television program about the community in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, which is uh, Afro-Caribbean and a lot of Hasidic Jewish as well, and how they coexist with each other. So the scene in this painting is, is something that I kind of witnessed typically um, on Eastern Parkway. It was, really uh, an interesting place to, to grow up. Do you know, I, I think I asked you this in the previous podcast, but you know, I always recognize there's always, you know, eyes, yeah. big eyes on your, on your pieces. Yeah. Um, what, what, what does that kind of stand for? It stands for different things and, in, in, you know, in the paintings, it's like in this, you know, there's some kind of dreamlike eyes that are in the background and the person in the background can be like a witness to the scene that's happening. Okay. Sometimes it's kind of romantic, sometimes dreamlike. You okay. know, it really depends on the rest of the, the painting. And uh, we just spoke off air slightly about these. Uh, these are hair salon chairs that so, you salvaged. Yeah, these are some like, you know, these are some salon chairs that Crash and I salvaged from the Andrew Freeman home up in the Bronx. Am I allowed to sit? Uh, no. Yeah, if you want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've never, I've never experienced a, a chair like this. Yeah, yeah. So, so they're 
Yeah. And, you know, they're, they were part of an installation that we, we did at the Andrew Freeman home some years ago. Yeah, they're and, cool. Uh, yeah, and we kept it. I think they're from the 1950s. I was going to say, they're very, very retro. I mean, that, because I, I just asked you, what, what, what is that? And you just explained to me, that's a hairdryer. Yeah. And, and, and people, predominantly females, I would say, were just sitting in his chair, in his chair for like... For hours. Hours. So, yeah, we salvaged these and they were part of an installation that we created at that time. And, um, you know, people could sit in them within the room and kind of look at the rest of the installation. Sounds, yeah. So this is a painting I did in Singapore, maybe in 2010. Really like that. Uh, it's a painting, I had a great exhibition there. Um, and it's a huge space and I needed to create some, some other larger works. So this is a painting that kind of has my typical palette, which is spray paint, acrylic, and the figures are um, done in charcoal. Cool. Um, I, you know, whenever I'm when I'm traveling, I find myself um, inspired by a lot of the places that I visit, and and uh, this kind of came out of that. Yeah, it's really nice. I like that a lot. Um, and uh, this this guy over here, who's he? Oh, this is from like 1985. These are cutouts I did of a man with a saxophone or a man. And, you know, so long ago, I'm, I'm sure they were incorporated in some show that happened, but they're from like the 80s. They're 85. very cool. They're very cool. On plywood. Which, um, so just a bit of experience from, from, from what I do, obviously promoting, uh, you know, street art, predominantly Hamilton and a few others, including yourself. I've had a lot, lot of collectors always ask about the 80s. They always yeah. want 80s pieces. I mean, yeah. I even asked you before about one of your 80s drawings. They're very, very sought after. Why is that? Why do people want 80s? Who the hell knows? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think it's, you know, the, the, the 80s in New York City was a really, really special time that happened. It was a creative melting pot that was going on. I mean, you know, between myself, Futura 2000, Crash, but artists like Jean-Michel Basquiat, Keith Haring, Kenny Scharf, Richard Hamilton, obviously, you know, on to Julian Schnabel and David Sally, all that was kind of happening in New York in the early 80s. It was an incredible thing to be a part of. And I think that people recognized that they, they that this was a special time and they want something that's representative <coughs> of that period. However, you know, um, it's finite now and it's, it's becoming more and more difficult to get anything from that period, so. And then even if you look at, you know, the auction results from the 80s, from all the key artists that like you said, yeah. they seem to be going wildly, wildly crazy. Yeah, as you know, people always want what they can't have. So, <laughs> yeah. that's what it is. Yeah, this is a sculpture that I made uh, last year. The character's called The Big Boss, and he is a kind of comical character, somewhat. Someone that could be, a CEO of a huge company or a mobster or both, as they sometimes are. <laughs> uh, somebody like that. It's a bit of a it's a bit of a character of that type of character, but he's carrying his attache case and he's gesturing off and yeah. you know, he's 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 kind of funny, so it's good. Yeah, I, it was somebody that I was drawing and for a while over the years and I thought, you know, when I kind of turned him into a three-dimensional sculpture. I know there's a lot of artists such as uh, even Cause and I mean there's so many to, to mention but they've done sculptures like this and they've, they've either been featured in a big hotel somewhere or they might be in some kind of uh, park. Yeah. Would this be something that could feature outdoors? Absolutely. And it's this protected? particular This particular sculpture, no. Uh, it's not meant to be outdoors because it's untreated, but I have produced sculpture that is meant to be outdoors. It okay. just have to, it has to be treated in a certain way and the process has to be approached in a different way to be able to withstand the elements. And if I could just ask, um, how, would, how much would something like this set, set you back? Uh, I don't even know. I mean, these are like presented to galleries, you know, you, you'd have to talk to them, but it is, it, it's not cheap. Yeah, I can imagine. Well, well, maybe, maybe some people it is cheap, but... <laughs> but uh, We're talking about tens of thousands though, right? At least. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. I think it's really, really good piece of art. And anything else that you can show me that stands out? Um, you know, this is a painting behind it. 
uh, called Pigeons in a Tunnel, and it's a bit of a little preview for an exhibition, for a painting I'm gonna put in an upcoming exhibition. And it's something that I just witnessed on my way here, is that, you know, sometimes in the subway, you'll see these pigeons that are underground, and you're wondering how, how they got there, you know, in the first place, and they're obviously trying to get out. But, <clears throat> you know, I, I, this, in this scene, they kind of represent a certain amount of freedom. Do you know what? The, 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 it's so f actually funny that you said this because when I got to uh, the airport, JFK, I was collecting my bags and I thought I was going crazy and I could hear a tweet and I thought, what's that? And as I looked up, there was a bird. Yeah. And I'm thinking, how the hell has it got into this, into this part of the airport? And I was actually a little bit sad because clearly he's probably not going to get out of there, not, not unless someone saves it. And uh, yeah, so I can see how and why that would inspire some of your work. Does, does like nature and you know animals and things like that, does it, does it inspire your work quite a lot? Absolutely, and lately it's been, in, you know, uh, a lot of the content of my mural work outside has featured um, more natural elements and less urban things. So, okay. you know, it could be like a, a frog, turtles, lizards, reptiles, birds, things like that yeah. uh, in, in I think by placing them in, in an, an urban environment, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, look, um, I appreciate your time here no, and, no and, and showing show, show me around your cool studio and also some of your great, great artwork. I know you, you got so many projects to, to, to jump on, so I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, thank you again. Yeah, and, no uh, problem. Yeah, I hope this uh, relationship will flourish and we can do some more business together and, you know, have a strong 2022. Yeah, cool. Thank you. All right, man. Thank you. Cheers. Take it easy.